David Ricardo was an English political economist. He was one of the most influential of the classical economists, along with Thomas Malthus, Adam Smith, and James Mill. Perhaps his most important legacy is his theory of comparative advantage, which suggests that a nation should concentrate its resources solely in industries where it is most internationally competitive while trading with other countries to obtain products either never produced nationally or no longer produced nationally as a result of industry specialization. In essence, Ricardo promoted the idea of extreme industry specialization by nations to the point of dismantling internationally competitive and otherwise profitable industries. In this worldview Ricardo took as a given the existence of an industry policy aimed at promoting and or subsidizing some national industries to the detriment of others. For Ricardo central planning was a given. Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage has been challenged by, among others, Joan Robinson and Piero Straffa, but remains the cornerstone of the argument in favor of international free trade. Comparative advantage paved the way for the promotion of globalization via increased international trade, which is the guiding theme in the policies promoted by the OECD and the World Trade Organization where it is assumed that international trade automatically leads to increased economic prosperity. The results of the implementation of this type of policy agenda are debated and increasingly controversial. That said, the assumption that increased levels of international trade is economically beneficial is generally unchallenged in mainstream economics. Ricardo began his professional life as a financial market broker and financial market speculator. As a result, he amassed a considerable personal fortune, with his largest windfall coming as a direct result of the carefully planned manipulation of British financial markets which he undertook during the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. Immediately following this questionable financial coup he retired. He was 41 years old. In February 1819 he entered British Parliament following his purchase of a seat in August 1818. He held the seat until his death on the 11th of September 1823. He was 51 years old. Personal life. Born in London, England. Ricardo was the third of 17 children of a Sephardic Jewish family of Portuguese origin who had recently relocated from the Dutch Republic. His father, Abraham Ricardo, was a successful stockbroker. He began working with his father at the age of 14. At age 21, Ricardo eloped with a Quaker, Priscilla Ann Wilkinson, and, against his father's wishes, converted to Christianity. This religious difference resulted in estrangement from his family, and he was led to adopt a position of independence. His father disowned him and his mother apparently never spoke to him again. Following his estrangement from his father he started a successful business as a broker with the support of Lubbock's and Forster, an eminent banking house. Although already successful as a broker, he made the bulk of his fortune as a result of speculation on the outcome of the Battle of Waterloo, using methods which today would result in prosecution for insider trading and market manipulation. Prior to the battle, Ricardo posted an observer to convey early results of the outcome. He then deliberately created the mistaken impression the French had won by initially openly selling British securities. A market panic ensued. Following this panic he moved to buy British securities at a steep discount. The Sunday Times reported in Ricardo's obituary, published on 14 September 1823 that during the Battle of Waterloo Ricardo netted upwards of a million sterling, a huge sum at the time. Following this trading coup, he retired. He purchased Gatcombe Park, an estate in Gloucestershire, now owned by Princess Anne, the Princess Royal. He was appointed High Sheriff of Gloucestershire for 1818-19. Some years into retirement, Ricardo became keen to enter Parliament and in August 1818 he secured Lord Port Arlington's borough for £4,000, as part of the terms of a loan of £25,000. 
As a result, Ricardo entered the House of Commons, representing Port Harlington, an Irish rotten borough. He was 47 years of age. His record in Parliament was that of an earnest reformer. He held the seat until his death four years later. Ricardo was a close friend of James Mill. Other notable friends included Jeremy Bentham and Thomas Malthus with whom Ricardo had a considerable debate over such things as the role of landowners in a society. He also was a member of Malthus' political economy club, and a member of the King of Clubs. He was one of the original members of the Geological Society. His sister was author Sarah Ricardo Porter. Parliamentary record. He voted with opposition in support of the liberal movements in Naples, the 21st of February, and Sicily, the 21st of June, and for an inquiry into the administration of justice in Tobago, the 6th of June. He divided for repeal of the Blasphemous and Seditious Libels Act, the 8th of May, inquiry into the Peterloo Massacre, the 16th of May, and abolition of the death penalty for forgery, the 25th of May, the 4th of June 1821. He adamantly supported the implementation of free trade. He voted against renewal of the sugar duties, the 9th of February, and objected to the higher duty on East as opposed to West Indian produce, the 4th of May 1821. He opposed the timber duties. He voted silently for parliamentary reform, the 25th of April, the 3rd of June, and spoke in its favour at the Westminster Anniversary Reform Dinner, the 23rd of May 1822. He again voted for criminal law reform, the 4th of June. His friend John Lewis Malick commented, He meets you upon every subject that he has studied with a mind made up, and opinions in the nature of mathematical truths. He spoke of parliamentary reformer Ballard as a man who would bring such things about, and destroy, the existing system tomorrow, if it were in his power, and without the slightest doubt on the result. It is this very quality of the man's mind, his entire disregard of experience and practice, which makes me doubtful of his opinions on political economy, death and legacy. Ten years after retiring and four years after entering Parliament Ricardo died from an infection of the middle ear that spread into the brain in induced septicemia. He was 51. He had eight children, including three sons, of whom Osman Ricardo and another David Ricardo became members of Parliament, while the third, Mortimer Ricardo, served as an officer in the lifeguards and was a deputy lieutenant for Oxfordshire. Ricardo is buried in an ornate grave in the churchyard of St. Nicholas in Harden Hewish, now a suburb of Chippenham, Wiltshire. The inscription on his grave reads, A Jew, born in Holland. He was one of the first free traders and a famous radical in his day. At the time of his death his fortune was estimated at about £600,000. Ideas Ricardo became interested in economics after reading Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations in 1799. He wrote his first economics article at age 37. Ricardo's idea became accepted in England and have became orthodox economic ideas in the modern Western world where the government is seen as having a determining role in economic development. He was also an abolitionist, speaking at a meeting of the Court of the East India Company in March 1823, where he said he regarded slavery as stain on the character of the nation. His sister, Hannah, had married David Samuda who came from a slave-owning family with a substantial number of slaves in Jamaica. Comparative advantage between 1500 and 1750 Most economists advocated mercantilism which promoted the idea of international trade for the purpose of gaining bullion by running a trade surplus with other countries. Ricardo challenged the idea that the purpose of trade was merely to accumulate gold or silver. With comparative advantage, Ricardo argued in favor of industry specialization and free trade. He attempted to prove, using simple mathematics, that industry specialization combined with free international trade always produces positive results. This theory expanded on the concept of absolute advantage. 
Ricardo argued that there is mutual national benefit from trade even if one country is more competitive in every area than its trading counterpart, and that a nation should concentrate resources only on industries where it had a comparative advantage, that is in those industries in which it has the greatest competitive edge. Ricardo suggested that national industries which were, in fact, Profitable and internationally competitive should be jettisoned in favor of the most competitive industries. Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage assumes the existence of an industry and trade policy at a national level. It does not presume that business decisions are or should be made independently by entrepreneurs on the basis of viability or profit. Ricardo attempted to prove, using a simple numerical example, that international trade is always beneficial. Paul Samuelson called the numbers used in Ricardo's numerical example dealing with trade between England and Portugal the four magic numbers. In spite of the fact that the Portuguese could produce both cloth and wine with less amount of labor, Ricardo suggested that theoretically both countries benefit from trade with each other, as Joan Robinson subsequently pointed out in reality. Following an opening of free trade with England, Portugal endured centuries of economic underdevelopment. The imposition of free trade on Portugal killed off a promising textile industry and left her with a slow-growing export market for wine, while for England, exports of cotton cloth led to accumulation, mechanization and the whole spiraling growth of the Industrial Revolution. Robinson argued that Ricardo's example required that economies were in static equilibrium positions with full employment and that there could not be a trade deficit or a trade surplus. These conditions, she wrote, were not relevant to the real world. She also argued that Ricardo's theory did not take into account that some countries may be at different levels of development and that this raised the prospect of unequal exchange, which might hamper a country's development. As we saw in the case of Portugal, protectionism like Adam Smith, Ricardo was an opponent of protectionism for national economies, especially for agriculture. He believed that the British Corn Laws tariffs on agricultural products ensured that less productive domestic land would be harvested and rents would be driven up. Thus, profits would be directed toward landlords and away from the emerging industrial capitalists. Since Ricardo believed landlords tended to squander their wealth on luxuries rather than invest, he believed that the Corn Laws were leading to the stagnation of the British economy. In 1846, his nephew John Lewis Ricardo, MP for Stoke-on-Trent, advocated free trade and the repeal of the Corn Laws. Modern empirical analysis of the Corn Laws yield mixed results. Parliament repealed the Corn Laws in 1846. Value theory Ricardo's most famous work is his Principles of Political Economy and Taxation. Ricardo opens the first chapter with a statement of the labor theory of value. His labor theory of value required several assumptions. Both sectors have the same wage rate and the same profit rate. The capital employed in production is made up of wages only. The period of production has the same length for both goods. Ricardo himself realized that the second and third assumptions were quite unrealistic and hence admitted two exceptions to his labor theory of value. Production periods may differ. The two production processes may employ instruments and equipment his capital and not just wages, and in very different proportions. Ricardo continued to work on his value theory to the end of his life. He has been credited with influencing famous investor Nate Moody and ultimately his value theory was the basis for what we now refer to as the Moody effect as it pertains to equities. Rent Ricardo is responsible for developing theories of rent, wages, and profits. He defined rent as the difference between the produce obtained by the employment of two equal quantities of capital and labor. Ricardo believed that the process of economic development 
which increased land utilization and eventually led to the cultivation of poorer land, principally benefited landowners. According to Ricardo, such premium over real social value that is reaped due to ownership constitutes value to an individual but is at best a paper monetary return to society. The portion of such purely individual benefit, and exclusively that portion, that accrues to scarce resources such as land or gold, over and above any socially beneficial exchange, Ricardo labels, rent. Ricardo concluded that a tax on land value, equivalent to a tax on the land rent, minus the improvements, was the only form of taxation that would not lead to price increases. Land itself has no cost of production, because it is not produced by humans. Thus, the price is not determined by the cost, but only by the best available rent-free alternative, not by the tax burdens of the person claiming exclusive use. Malthus's criticism and extrapolation of the problem of Ricardian rent in attempting to demonstrate that Ricardian rent constitutes value for nothing. Ricardo was neglecting Say's law that all savings by definition equals investment. Malthus suggested that rent, however misplaced, constitutes a prime source of savings and investment for the future. Ricardo's theories of wages and profits Several authorities consider that Ricardo is the source of the concepts behind the so-called iron law of wages according to which wages naturally tend to a subsistence level. Others dispute the assignment to Ricardo of this idea. In his theory of profit, Ricardo stated that as real wages increase, real profits decrease because the revenue from the sale of manufactured goods is split between profits and wages. He said in his essay on profits, profits depend on high or low wages, wages on the price of necessaries and the price of necessaries chiefly on the price of food, criticism of the Ricardian theory of trade. Ricardo's argument in favor of free trade has been attacked by those who believe trade restriction can be necessary for the economic development of a nation. UTSA Patnaik claims that Ricardian theory of international trade contains a logical fallacy. Ricardo assumed that in both countries two goods are producible and actually are produced, but developed and underdeveloped countries often trade those goods which are not producible in their own country. For example, many northern countries do not produce tropical fruits. In these cases, one cannot define which country has comparative advantage. Critics also argue that Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage is flawed in that it assumes production is continuous and absolute. In the real world, events outside the realm of human control can disrupt production. In this case, specialization could cripple a country that depends on imports from foreign, naturally disrupted countries. For example, if an industrially based country trades its manufactured goods with an agrarian country in exchange for agricultural products, a natural disaster in the agricultural country may cause an industrially based country to starve. The development economist Ha Junchang challenges the argument that free trade benefits every country. Ricardo's theory is absolutely right, within its narrow confines. His theory correctly says that, accepting their current levels of technology as given, it is better for countries to specialize in things that they are relatively better at. One cannot argue with that. His theory fails when a country wants to acquire more advanced technologies, that is, when it wants to develop its economy. It takes time and experience to absorb new technologies. So technologically backward producers need a period of protection from international competition during this period of learning. Such protection is costly, because the country is giving up the chance to import better and cheaper products. However, it is a price that has to be paid if it wants to develop advanced industries. Ricardo's theory is, thus seen, for those who accept the status quo but not for those who want to change it. Ricardian equivalence. Another idea associated with Ricardo is Ricardian equivalence, an argument suggesting that in some circumstances a government's choice of how to pay for its spending might have no effect on the economy. 
Ricardo notes that the proposition is theoretically implied in the presence of intertemporal optimization by rational taxpayers, but that since taxpayers do not act so rationally, the proposition fails to be true in practice. Thus, while the proposition bears his name, he does not seem to have believed it. Economist Robert Barrow is responsible for its modern prominence.